My name is Kirsten Elliott. I'm the Director of Philanthropy at the Center for Election Science. We are a nonpartisan nonprofit dedicated to empowering communities by improving the way that they vote. Um, one of the big ways we do that is we help communities that are suffering from broken elections with advocating for uh, better voting methods. And primarily, we like approval voting because it's a really simple, cost-effective way to bring about that change. So we are currently working in St. Louis, Missouri to make it the second city in the U.S. to adopt approval voting. And one of the big questions that we get, you know, is like, well, why St. Louis? Why do they need this? So I've seen Wally speak um, several times in St. Louis, and he knows a lot about uh, especially recent elections and why this is so needed. So we wanted to take a minute to have a conversation with him today. So I will be moderating the event. If you have any questions, you can ask them in the chat. Um, and I will try to get to them um, either by responding to you or at the end, we will let you ask them to Wally. You can also use the raise hand function if you would like to ask a question. Um, one little uh, housekeeping rule is if we can try to keep this pretty focused to approval voting or to St. Louis, that would be great. There's a lot of big voting methods topics and we wanna make sure that we kind of stay on topic. Um, so we're respectful of everyone's time. So that's that for me. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Raleigh, our Director of Campaigns and Advocacy, so that he can introduce Wally and get going. Great. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, as she said, I am the uh, Director of Campaigns and Advocacy at the Center for Election Science. Uh, so that means I work with uh, our partners uh, throughout the country who are interested in advancing better uh, voting methods, especially approved voting. Um, we work especially with uh, folks in St. Louis, St. Louis approves, uh, and uh, Wally has seen that work, hopefully, <laughs> which I know that he, is, he has, and uh, uh, we are talking with Wally today as uh, he has a uh, front row seat to a lot of what's going on in, in uh, not only St. Louis, but in Missouri. So I will give his formal introduction and I'll let him introduce himself. So Dr. Wally Seward is over a decade of experience as a, uh, in, in civic and political engagement. Uh, he started out as an organizer, just like, just like myself. I'm sure we'll talk about that at some point. Um, and from 2011 to 2017, Dr. Seward was the director of the Center for Ethics and Public Life at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. Uh, during that time, uh, the center established itself as a statewide hub for public ethics, information, conferences, workshops, research, best practices, legislative tracting, uh, community collaboration, and more. Uh, he is an avid woodworker, he says, and enjoys animals. So uh, and, uh, now he is the uh, director of civic engagement uh, and Focus Impact Fellows at Focus St. Louis. So Wally, thank you for joining us and uh, please tell us a little bit more about yourself. Well, happy to be here. Uh, thanks for the invitation. So um, let's see, a little bit more about myself. I did start out as an organizer. Uh, back of the envelope calculation, I've knocked on probably 150,000 doors over the course of a door-to-door -door campaign organizing, mostly around consumer issues, utility, healthcare, not, uh, not candidate campaigns. Uh, these were all issue campaigns. Um, after that, went to grad school, uh, got my PhD in political and moral theory, thought I was gonna go the kind of traditional teaching route. Ended up running a Center for Ethics in Public Life, uh, which really gave me the opportunity to kind of build bridges between the people who study politics and the people who actually practice it. Um, so the goal was uh, to have informed decision making in the public sphere, but also to bring public sphere actual experience back into academia to inform the discussion there. Uh, that definitely needs to be a two way street. Uh, for the past three years, I've been the Director of Civic Engagement for Focus St. Louis, which is a nonprofit that does leadership development in the St. Louis region, um, which gives me the opportunity to hold a lot of public forums, get engaged in a lot of uh, campaigns that are going on, uh, both issue campaigns, uh, uh, protests, uh, candidate campaigns uh, going on in the region and addressing some of our region's most, uh, most powerful, uh, most uh, pressing issues. I have actually found St. Louis to be an amazing place uh, to do politics. 
um, partly because of the problems that it does have. Um, we have the nation's problems kind of boiled down to a nice concentrated stew. I like to think kind of everything runs to the middle. Um, we sit in between north versus south, east versus west, uh, rich versus poor, rural versus urban, black versus white, old industrial economy versus new, new entrepreneurial economy. Like it's all right here. St. Louis has the nation's problem. So we, we can find, I like to think that that means we're the space where the solutions are going to grow. Right, it's where the disease is most prevalent. Is where the uh, resistant bacteria uh, kind of uh, evolves. So that's the hope. Um, that's what I've been doing for the last few years, um, and happy to be here. All right. Well, thank you, Wally. Um, and I will start with basically the, the title of of the talk, which is "How Do We Get Here?" So, yeah. if you want to give just a brief. Uh, again, you said you moved there in, in 2011, but just what have you seen, you know, being there a, a decade now, nearly a decade, you know, what have you seen uh, in, in the briefest history you can give us of, of the elections in St. Louis? Sure. Um, well, the elections in St. Louis, uh, first of all, there are many, many, right? Uh, because St. Louis City is only 300,000 people, the city itself proper. St. Louis County, which surrounds the city, um, is more than double that. And the metropolitan region uh, includes about uh, seven more counties. But we're talking only about St. Louis City proper with the STL approves, uh, uh, because we, got, we wanna get our, get our toehold in the region. So I'll talk a little bit about the city proper. And to give you a sense of the kind of civic arrangements in the city, uh, city is uh, roughly 50-50 uh, black and white. Um, we have a relatively small Latinx population. We do have a sizable uh, foreign born uh, population uh, that range from all over Bosnian, East Asian uh, that, that are part of the picture as well. But because of the history, uh, because of the demographics, because of the, de the, the, the prevalence of these issues, um, the African American population is really the core of kind of how are we trying to empower uh, folks that uh, haven't had power in the past. That kind of uh, power vacuum uh, for large segments of the St. Louis population can be seen in the St. Louis governmental structure. Um, we have had a black caucus in the Board of Aldermen for only about 30 years, um, that's all. And that caucus is, um, like most uh, caucuses, deeply fractious and uh, has a very, very difficult time presenting a united front on, uh, on issues. And that deeply fractious uh, kind of nature of uh, the politics in St. Louis has been seen in the elections. Um, I can give you two very, very recent examples of elections that desperately needed help. So in St. Louis, of course, we have still the traditional uh, uh, primary uh, where uh, the pluralistic uh, winner of the primary takes all um, and there then the nomination to go on to the general. Because St. Louis is prominently uh, predom predominantly pre preeminently democratic, um, that primary is essentially the election. And since it's a plurality uh, win, we have right now a mayor and a president of the Board of Aldermen, two of the most powerful seats in city government, who got elected in a primary with less than 33% of the vote. In other words, 60 plus percent of the voters actually preferred someone else. But then when it got to the, uh, when it got to the uh, uh, regular election, um, the only choice was between uh, a Republican whom nobody, whom nobody in the city was voting for and the one Democrat that came out of the primary. Uh, so that's the uh, president of the Board of Alderman, Lewis Reed, and our mayor, uh, Lyda Krusen. It was those two elections, although there is a long history of this happening, those two elections uh, really laid bare the uh, practice in St. Louis of stacking black candidates, 
Essentially, what that is, is you stack the, the primary with black candidates, which divides the black vote. And then the white, uh, can, the only white candidate in the race, Mayor Lida Krusen in this case, wins by only getting elected by 33% of the vote, which meant that she only had to focus on certain areas. She only had certain sets of constituencies that she had to keep happy. Um, and that's a practice that goes way back. I can't talk about that long history. I haven't been here since 2000. I've only been here since 2011, but it's become really obvious if you watch uh, recent elections here. Uh, now, Lewis Reed, the president of the Boulder of Alderman, is African American. He's been there for quite a while. Um, I would not consider him a member of any kind of progressive wing of the Democratic Party um, as deep ties to existing interests, especially the big issue in St. Louis development, um, handing out tax subsidies and, uh, to developers. Uh, he is very much a part of uh, kind of business as usual on that front, both he and Lida Cruz, and then their, uh, their election wins really, um, uh, really unfortunately, at a time just five years post uh, Ferguson, so have solidified, uh, re-solidified that business as usual uh, politics here in St. Louis. Um, I think that uh, that uh, the voting systems that we are talking about here with approval voting can definitely have a massive impact. Um, what exactly that impact is, of course, hard, hard to uh, predict as always uh, when you mess with systems. Uh, those outcomes are difficult to predict, but it's really hard to imagine outcomes more broken than the current ones. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm I, I and I'll I'll hold there because I've been talking for a little bit. Um, I as we come up to it, I can also talk a little bit about how I think approval voting will hopefully kind of shift those dynamics. Thanks, Wally. Well, that that was. Um, Awesome overview. So uh, just to kind of, uh, I'll weave in some of the questions from the from our folks as we kind of see them and curse them also. Um, I was really interested to hear, you know, uh, about the stacking when I saw one question in, 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 the, um, uh, in the comments. So can you explain a little bit more about how that would work and basically kind of what why would people do that? Why would yeah? Why would people um, sign up to help stack or be you know or yeah? That's a really good question. Um, so the stacking is a simple explanation for a complex phenomenon, right? Um, when, when, when we look, for instance, at the last mayoral election, and we looked at seven, eight, nine African-American candidates, uh, one kind of mainstream white candidate, um, I don't want to accuse the African-American candidates on there of somehow being having been hired and callously on the, on the ticket simply only because someone talked them into helping the only white candidate get elected, right? That's, that's, it's generally not that blatant. But it's also not that difficult to motivate and push folks to get into the election for their own personal uh, aggrandizement reasons. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to downplay the importance of hard fought primaries, right? Primaries and party elections, in, in, inter, intra party elections build strength within movements. Uh, they weed out, uh, they weed, it's, it's important that we have those kinds of, uh, those kinds of debates and discussions. Oops. Sorry. 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 Everything's okay. <laughs> need it, need it. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everybody. It's all it's good. Okay. Uh, so, what happens a lot of times, I think, is that candidates who have a relatively small base of support don't have, say, a citywide base of support are encouraged to run, are given some resources to run um, from sources that largely see them as a distraction, although they might not themselves see themselves that way. Um, 
But the, the result is uh, that you have a large portion of the voting uh, public in St. Louis have their vote split between several candidates uh, that they are torn between um, and leave a candidate that they don't prefer to actually actually win the election. And, and uh, I, you seem very excited to kind of give us your idea about how approved voting may improve the situation. So why do you think that? Okay, well, so for instance, um, if we look at the president of the Board of Aldermen race, uh, there were essentially three uh, viable candidates in that race. Uh, one of whom was the, uh, was the incumbent, uh, the, the Lewis Reed, the uh, pres current president of the Board of Aldermen. One of whom was uh, Megan Green, who, was a, who is a member of the Board of Aldermen, a very progressive uh, uh, white candidate. The other was Jamila Nasheed, African-American state senator with a long history of work in the region. Um, and I know a lot of people that were really torn between those two candidates. They knew they weren't, uh, they weren't down with the status quo. They knew they didn't want to continue things as they were, but they got really, really torn between those two uh, candidates. I won't get into the specific details of why those two candidates presented a very difficult choice, uh, especially for progressive voters. But so we had to make this choice, right? Which, and, and the, 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 the calculus isn't just which one of them do I prefer, the calculus is also which one of them is gonna get enough votes to beat Lewis Reed. And that's one of those classic coordination problems. I don't know what to do till I know what you're gonna do, but you don't know what to do until you know what I'm gonna do and nobody's allowed to say anything or, or, or nobody's telling anybody who they're gonna vote for because we're all friends and nobody wants to make anybody mad. So um, in the end, what happened was that uh, Lewis Reed won the election by just a tiny, tiny, tiny margin, won that primary, then went on, of course, to win the general election. If approval voting had been in place, I could have checkmarked both Megan Green and Jamila Nasheed, and I would have been able to register that these were my two preferences. And anybody that was voting for one or the other that could, that would have been preferred, let's say you voted for Jamila Nasheed, you would have preferred, still preferred Megan Green to, all the, to uh, President Reed. You could have done that. You could have voted for both, in which case then the top two vote getters which may have been those two, it may have been uh, one of them and President Reed would have gone to a runoff and we would have had a real choice between two viable candidates in the general election as opposed to uh, essentially just the choice between the one candidate produced by the Democratic primary and a couple of other candidates from other parties uh, that no one saw uh, as serious. So approval voting, just in terms of that story just shows like what it would have been like for me as a voter to be able to register my uh, preferences better. From a more academic viewpoint, if we look at voting as a mathematical theory exercise in how do we get as much information out of every voter about their preferences as possible through this one visit, well then the approval voting gives you a lot more information about my preferences, right? Because you saw that I voted for Jamila Nasheed, I would have preferred Megan Green. Um, you, you could get all that from me and you can give a better picture of the voters' actual preferences. So if you think of voting as that kind of math informational exercise, approval voting is a huge leap forward in terms of understanding the actual preferences of each individual voter. Um, you can get more precise, uh, right? Ranked choice voting, for instance, might give you a precisely which ones I prefer above others, but I'm not sure that that's a vast difference. And that was actually a form of voting that we couldn't institute here in St. Louis without a major change in our infrastructure, without the machines themselves being changed. Um, so I think approval voting is a really, really powerful tool. And I think the folks here in St. Louis, uh, 
it's going to be very, very interesting. Now that we've actually gotten on, gotten the uh, uh, question on the ballot, we don't know exactly which election yet, if, if I remember right. Uh, Ben's here, so he can he can answer that question. Um, but now that we've gotten on the ballot, it's going to be very interesting to see the responses from kind of the uh, powers that be out in St. Louis, right? Those folks that have been getting elected from their wards uh, or from the uh, from very small power bases that are gonna have to start creating a wider campaigns because they can no longer win with 30% of the vote. Um, so I'm very curious what that's gonna look like and who's gonna come out of the woodwork to say this is good or isn't good. One of the measuring, uh, statistics for St. Louis is always how does this help bring power to traditionally disempowered populations, uh, poor populations in St. Louis, uh, largely African American populations. I think the answer there is clear, uh, given the stories that I have been telling. Um, but there are a lot of folks in the African American political power structure that's that. Um, will react more along the lines of preserve my power structure and less along the lines of this is better for democracy. So it's gonna be a complex reaction from the public, I'm guessing. There's gonna be some public information that needs to be done. There is so much good information to unpack there, Wally. Um, I have several questions in my own brain, but we have some in the chat that I think are great. So you touched on this just a little bit, um, but Colin asked, why do you think approval is better for St. Louis than ranked choice or another method? So, I mean, obviously there's the, you know, technical component right now of the machines just won't handle it. Um, I want to say that, and Benjamin Singer with uh, St. Louis Approves is on the call too. So Benj may be able to give um, some info in the chat here, but I wanna say that was like a couple million dollar uh, investment or somewhere along there, like a very large financial investment for the city. But I mean, if that wasn't the case, if somebody was willing to come in and take care of that, you know, do you think approval voting is the right option or, um, you know, would you be looking at something like ranked choice or score? Um, you know, what are your thoughts there, Wally, on what would really make sense? So um, I don't know if I would prefer ranked choice to approval voting. One of the issues that a lot of people bring up with these voting systems is the, the complexity of the choice that voters are faced with. Um, and the nice thing about approval voting is it's a nice short instruction line, right? Put a check mark next to every candidate you approve. Instead of put a one next to your top choice, your, your uh, two next to your second choice, things like that. Although I tend to say, I tend to give the voters more credit than a lot of people do. Uh, I think they're, they're empowered enough to make those decisions. So I don't know if I could say, um, you know, whether ranked choice or approval voting would all other things being equal, which one I would prefer. It is true that ranked choice, if you look at it as that kind of mathematical informational question, ranked choice gives you more information about their voters' preferences because you, they can check mark four uh, candidates for approval voting. You know they, they're okay with those four. With ranked choice, they, you would actually know which one of those four is their top, second, third choice. If you ask me in a completely, uh, you know, made up world, if I could just bring in any voting system that I wanted, what I would probably go for is the same thing we do online every day, which is the five star system. So you give every candidate zero through five stars. So that kind of rolls all those systems into one because I could give candidates five stars and they would be like, yep, I approve all these four candidates. I could rank them, give one of them four stars, one of them three stars, one of them two stars, one of them one star. I could give one of them five stars and I could give two others two stars and zero stars to a couple of others. Like there is a vast amount of a, a way that I can I can formulate that, that, that. And that's the way that we do online product uh, 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 approval, right, for, for Amazon right now. How many stars do you give this product? Uh, they did all this math, uh, and they figured out how to suck the most information out of the consumer that they possibly can. Now, again, I the most important thing is, yes, that's in some, you know, in some fantasy world where we can just start from zero, 
Uh, that might be what I would want, but we also don't want to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And I think approval voting here in St. Louis is ready to go. It's on the ballot. Our machines can handle it. It's a simple thing to explain to voters. I think it's actually a, a really good fit for St. Louis at this time. Thanks, Wally. Uh, I'm going to bring up something Benj in the chat brought up a little bit, which is, uh, and you brought up a little bit, which is uh, the people that win, right? They win and, and they have, uh, and I'm talking, you know, more amorphously, not specific people, right? Can you explain more how, you know, and you can go into a little bit more detail later how the vote splitting hurts the voter, right? We know that, maybe the community. But how does the vote splitting and, and the winning by kind of these little margins maybe affect their mandate, maybe affect the decisions that they make? Um, you know, you get a front row seat and you're dedicated to how these folks make decisions. So how could something, and it's not the first thing people think about. So how can, how does this vote splitting or these small margins hurt or change how they make decisions? Yeah. So the tough thing about how office holders make decisions is they do it all inside their head. <laughs> right. <laughs> we don't have, we can't open those doors. However, there's some really clear dynamics at play here. Um, so first of all, there's really difficult questions about how public officials should make decisions, right? Um, I mean, we, you can go way into background questions of should they, should they actually make decisions based on what they believe their constituents' interests are, or what they believe their constituents' preferences are, because often those can come apart, right? They can think that this is better for you even though you think it isn't. That's, that's a separate question, probably. Another big consideration for them is holding on to the power that they've gained. And this motivation always often gets short shrift as though it's automatically negative for an elected official to take into account what it's going to take for them to keep their office. But the truth is that is something if, if an elected official is honestly working in the interest of their constituents, that is something they have to take into consideration, right? Um, I mean, you can just look at like, what's the dilemma for them when they see a big, massive contribution to their political action campaign, uh, uh, right, uh, uh, campaign. Um, they can say, I can accept this massive amount of money that I know is going to come with strings attached, or I can unilaterally disarm and give up the election to my opponent who I think is going to do horrible things to the constituents I'm trying to protect, right? So that's the kind of moral dilemma they're in. And there's a similar thing if you're sitting in office and you have to make a decision that even though you believe it's the right decision is going to hand your opponents some kind of uh, a weapon or fodder or a way to get you out of office next year and you have other political priorities besides just this one decision right because that's the tough part about political office it's not one decision at a time it's 10,000 decisions every time because it's not just, do we spend this $20 to fix the pothole? It's do we spend this $20 to fix the pothole or help the schools or hire some more teachers or, 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 right? So they're constantly in this dilemma. And so when we think about when they're making decisions about how to maintain their power, what we would like to do is we'd like to have the systems that put them and keep them in power as, mo as closely connected to the interests and preferences of as many voters as possible. And the difficulty with the winner-take-all primary is they only have to win with that 30% of the vote, which in this city can mean, hey, I've only got to win in the central corridor and south and far south city, uh, which is relatively white and relatively conservative compared to the rest of the city conservative inside the Democratic Party kind of spectrum. Um, and so in order to maintain power, in order to keep power, those are the populations that they're going to be pandering to. And any action, whether it be right or wrong, that endangers their connection to that particular interest group is going to be one that even if they wanted to do it, 
Maybe they have to make the political calculation. I can't simply because I'm foregoing my ability to be in this office and implement all these other political priorities that I have. It's not always uh, uh, cynical. It's not always power grabbing for the sake of power grabbing. It's also holding on to the power for the sake of the ideals that you got into public service in the first place. Right? Uh, I mean, as a public ethicist, I'm amazed how much time I spend actually defending people in public office as opposed to telling them how they ought to do their job because everyone's like, oh yeah, public ethics, that's an oxymoron, isn't it? Ha ha ha, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. And I'm like, no, it's not an oxymoron. It's a repetitive phrase. Uh, politics is the only answer we found to possibly the most difficult ethical question that faces us, which is how do we live together inside of a society and maintain the cooperation and collaboration that keeps our society strong while also recognizing and allowing every person's individual version of the good life uh, and their own personal political preferences. How you square that circle is not a single system. It's an ongoing process and that's politics. Politics is ethics. And most people that, especially the most people that get into local politics, do it because they feel like they have a, a constituency to serve, because they have issues that they want to put on the table. If we allow those who step up to the plate to get to the table, to get elected with only a small constituency, that's the constituency that they're going to pander to. And A, yeah, that gives them that in some ways makes things easier for them because they only have a certain limited set, a cohesive set of constituents that they can keep happy and keep their job, but it also limits them. It limits their ability to consider uh, the interests and the preferences of other uh, populations in the city, especially populations in the city uh, that have traditionally been disempowered. Uh, so I think approval voting by forcing uh, first, um, people to give their true preferences and hopefully getting rid of some of that spoiler effect in the primary, but then also making the general election a runoff between the top two vote getters. So it's not that in the general election, I, I have to vote, I have to choose between the Democratic candidate and the other guys that 30 people voted for inside of the Green Party, the Libertarian Party, and the Republican Party in St. Louis. Like, that's not a choice. Uh, so if I get a real choice in that general election between those top two vote getters, now we're starting to just see a little more access uh, uh, to power for populations that haven't felt it in the past, which also means those populations might actually have to show up in those communities. They might have to show their faces in those communities and listen face-to-face uh, -to, -face to folks in those communities where they really haven't in the past. I think you have hit on such an important part of this, Wally, which is that there is such a need to, like you said earlier, to bring power back to the people, especially those people who are just not having their voice heard. Um, and I think it's, it's really interesting if you're um, a Center for Election Science person and you've been on these calls, you're probably geeking out right now with Wally about the ethics side of this. And we're talking about the voting methods side, but something I think that we often overlook in our conversations is, you know, what does this actually mean for a human in St. Louis? And so I would love to pose that question. I mean, um, I have a very vivid picture of the day that I came to St. Louis and sat down with uh, Rasheen Aldridge, one of the members of the St. Louis Approves Committee. And we sat in this coffee shop and met people in St. Louis. And I was so inspired about how Rasheen said this could help people. But in, in your point of view, you know, what does this mean for a St. Louisan who's not being heard right now, who's not being represented? So the first thing I'll do is give a huge shout out to Rasheen. Uh, uh, he's a friend, uh, worked with him on a number of occasions. Um, and he's, in terms of, you know, kind of community voice and understanding the communities uh, that are in pain, he's definitely the better uh, source uh, than, I, than I am. But... What I hope is that 
communities in St. Louis, and that is not just the African-American population, right? That can be the Bosnian population, that can be our foreign-born population, that can be all uh, kinds of populations, Latinx population, start to see general elections in which candidates that they supported, even though they weren't necessarily the top tier candidates, might actually get a chance of being in that general election because they make it into the top two in that runoff. Uh, they hopefully can start seeing people that uh, look like them, talk like them, think like them, have some of their community experience, have some of their background experience in the general election, uh, which is the election everybody thinks of, uh, you know, when the decisions are made. Most voters are relatively low engagement voters. I hate the term low information voters because <laughs> it makes them sound idiotic. Like they're just... They're desperately trying to figure out the three jobs in the school and the child care and the, like they don't have time to study every political issue and every political candidate. So they, they have a limited amount of personal kind of energy that they can put toward engagement on this front. And so what they think of is the, the big election. They think of the, the general election. And if the general election is a top two runoff between the top vote getters, they're getting a real choice between two viable candidates, not just a candidate that's a Democratic, that they now feel, and I, I'm putting words in their mouth, that the Democratic Party is shoved down their throat and a bunch of non-viable candidates, right? Um, now, it's only a top two, uh, so it's not immediate and they don't get everybody on, on, the, uh, on the ballot that they would like, but it's definitely, uh, I think, a huge improvement. And the polling uh, that the project did, and Benj can probably talk a little more to this, but the polling that the project did, especially in the African community, right up front, people felt like this would better reflect their interests. They felt like they even might be more likely to vote if this were the process, because they felt like their vote was going to have a, a bigger impact. So hopefully that's the, that's the result. Thanks, Wally. I, uh, you talked about this uh, in, in one piece, which is how, you know, I'm, I, came, I come from campaign world, right? So uh, I've had those conversations you said where, you know, where do we need the votes, right? Where do I, where do we need to cut up the votes? And oftentimes, you know, the, it's the goal of the campaign to try to talk to as few people as possible because they only have so much money and time. Yeah. Let's say we get this that approved uh, voting, but the rest of the measure goes through. Um, can you tell us a little bit about a little bit more about how the campaigns are now, and how you think maybe the campaigns might change? Is right because that's how most voters, like you said, have any opportunity to interact with their potential decision making. Yeah. Um. I mean, it's a bit of a rabbit hole when you talk about insider speak for voter contact inside of campaigns, right? Because it is a world that has to, that has a really weird contradiction inside of it, which is vast optimism about what the voters can do and vast skepticism about who they can actually bring to the polls. Um, I mean, I remember Bruce Franks Jr., uh, who was a leader in the Ferguson protests, then stepped up and, and was elected to be a state representative, um, ran a really interesting campaign because, uh, you know, once it, once it got going, brought in some uh, kind of consultants that run these kind of campaigns, and they said, okay, you're going to contact the people on this list. These are the people that have voted in the last three elections uh, from these districts. And he said, no, I, I don't want to contact just the people on those lists. And he starts getting the real talk, right? We only have the money, the time, the manpower to, uh, to contact this many people. We need to make sure that those are high value targets. And he said, well, talk about high value targets. He flips through the book to the list of the people in the back that hadn't voted in the last three elections and points to his own name. <laughs> it says, um, right. so... <laughs> Right. So what kind of potential is in here that we're ignoring? Um, so the, the hope would be that while campaign managers inside, campaign, inside of campaigns are still going to be doing those calculations, right? Limited resources, uh, value our targets. 
they're still going to be doing that. Uh, we can't change their calculation because that's their job and that should be what they're doing. What we can change are the systemic uh, uh, kind of um, uh, uh, the settings that push them into only contacting voters in certain areas and certain kind of high value uh, voters because they know um, that say in the general election, they're only gonna have one Democrat on the, on the ballot. They are going to focus much more closely in. And if that Democrat, their campaign consultants are gonna say, look, all the, all the kind of hardcore Democrats are gonna vote for you anyway. We don't need to do outreach there. Or all the people in this community uh, that want this thing that you've said you're going to do, don't have any other choices, so we don't have to do outreach there. Um, if there's somebody else on the ballot, if, say, the runoff, the uh, president of the Board of Aldermen race here had been a runoff between, uh, I think it was Megan Green that actually got the second amount of, the second highest number of votes by just barely, and Lewis Reed, that general election would have had a vastly different dynamic in which both Megan Green and Lewis Reed ha would have to do a citywide outreach. There was virtually no outreach in that general election by Lewis Reed because he knew he didn't have to do it because he's the only Democrat in a, on the ticket in a Democratic city. So he didn't show up in communities. He didn't feel like he had to answer to those. That I think is, is one of the primary changes there in terms of the calculus that campaign professionals make. When you get down to the general election, you are going to have a second viable candidate on there that's going to appeal to Democrats in the city, and you're going to have to do a citywide outreach in order to uh, make sure you win instead of just writing the, the party letter uh, into office. And uh, that brings up uh, a little bit the uh, you talked about candidates not showing up, you know, and kind of maybe taking, you know, uh, sitting on their laurels a little bit. What uh, as we all think as as CES and as and STL proves is here. What are some uh, types of civic engagement that you've seen that do work? really well what should you know if uh, what have you seen that really motivates uh folks and maybe if you have any other stories of of you talking to people about uh you know approved voting and the and the ballot measure in general yeah so what kind of civic engagement works i mean that gets almost into a little bit of a theory of change right like what 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 actually gives you uh, options for change? When people ask me for about the, for a theory of change, um, I always I always have two two things. Number one, stories, and number two, pain. Those are, those are the only things that create change. Stories are the only thing that have the possibility of changing individual minds. Uh, right, the the story of Michael Brown in Ferguson, um, the story, the stories of police brutality that we're seeing around the country now that everyone has a video and social media. Um, that's on an individual level. When you look at institutions, the only thing that creates change is pain for those institutions. Um, if they feel the pain, uh, they they will respond. In terms of civic engagement connecting to those two things, um, I think that's why stories about how past elections might have looked given approval voting are important. Uh, because when you talk about process issues, it's easy for people to kind of you know glaze over um, unless they're all process nerds like we all clearly are. Um, so I think, uh, the when you talk about process bring stories to the table the process was like this the process would if it looked this way here's the story of how this would look different here's the different choices you would have here are the people with stories more like yours that might actually make it to the general election where you have the opportunity uh, to uh, elect them in terms of pain Right now, um, the citywide elections that this approval voting would apply to 
there, the pain for those offices would be that they have to reach a much broader audience in order to successfully make it back into office. Uh, the pain for them is going to be the way that machine politics have worked in the city in the past. And those are institutions, right? That's not people. That's those, those are institutions. Um, isn't going to work the same way anymore because the pathway to that electoral office has changed. That's going to create pain for them when they say, hey, we've still got the same limited resources for our campaign. But now we have to do outreach beyond the central West End and uh, South City and actually reach into some different areas, North City, downtown, in order to figure out, uh, in order to get those voters engaged, because we're not going to be able to get elected with that smaller voting block um, that we had before. So stories and pain. Um, and an important piece of this is also the fact that our voting participation is just abysmal uh, in the United States, right? We, we, we seem to be happy to fight wars for this right and then let it just languish. I don't know that I have any silver bullets for that, uh, for that question. I wish I did. I would have to go back to piece of the problem is how easy it is to tell a story about corruption and callousness in office and how easy it is for people to say people that are elected people that are going for elections they're just power hungry assholes pardon the french um i have no reason to put them in office uh, they're disqualified simply because they've raised their hand for office in my head, because it's only that kind of those kind of people that do that. And I think one of the most powerful things that, ha that has happened here recently in St. Louis is we've had some relatively non-traditional folks get, get elected into spaces. Bruce Franks Jr. would be a huge example. Uh, if you're in St. Louis and you know a little bit about the story about that election and the political family and machine that used to run things in that district uh, that he had actually ended up having to go in a legal battle against them about uh, illegally turned in uh, uh, absentee ballots in order to get into office. But him making it into office, uh, right? Rasheen making it into office. Um, we are seeing... Uh, another huge one, this isn't in the city, but the fact that majority white St. Louis County ejected the 30 year prosecutor who failed to make a case against the officer in the Michael Brown uh, shooting in Ferguson and put in a progressive African American prosecutor is mind blowing especially the fact that it's the county that did that. And I think it's the stories of Michael Brown, it's the stories of what progressive prosecutors had managed to do in other places. It's the stories of the people who we have sitting behind bars right now who are losing their job, losing their uh, apartment, losing their family because they can't afford a $500 bail on that speeding ticket they got six months ago uh, on a car they don't own anymore uh, and uh, to a residence that, where they don't, that was sent to a residence they don't live in anymore. Those kind of stories are changing people's minds about what it means to be engaged and who they can affect. Um, and I think that's one of the most powerful things. We, that's, what, that's one of the amazing things that the Close the Workhouse campaign has done here in the city of St. Louis. If you know anything about that, uh, they're working to close a very old medium security facility uh, that has a long history of treating inmates inhumanely um, and is really not necessary anymore given the other facilities that we have in town. Um, and they are both telling, telling stories of the people who are in that facility, the, their lives that they have lost simply because of, you know, a traffic ticket or a failure to pay alimony or some technical violation like that that puts them into, into jail for six months because they can't afford bail. They're telling those stories on the one hand, 
and they're making people understand the human cost of these policies. And on the other hand, they're creating pain for the people in office by advocating and organizing and bringing people to hearings and bringing people, uh, getting people to make phone calls and write letters. And it's working. They're, they're, they got a two prong. Uh, they got a two prong effect there. And the number one thing that creates civic engagement is a win, right? If one to close the workhouse actually manages to close the workhouse, hope the every and the hopefully everybody gets that sense. Look, we did this. Now let's move on to the next thing. Let's talk about. Good God, healthcare, right? Let's talk about transportation. Let's talk about housing. Let's talk about, let's talk about. Uh, capitalize on those wins that you make. Um, they are often hard to capitalize on because they come usually anticlimactically after years of a fight and maybe a legal battle. And by the time the decision gets made in, in a court somewhere that's way out of the headlines, but just make sure that people understand the victories that can happen. For instance, with STL approves, um, I mean, it, this, this has been an underdog fight from the beginning uh, in a lot of ways. And here we are, we're, we're ready with these signatures uh, and we're gonna be putting this thing on the ballot. And I think it's got a really good chance of passing. And that, as Margaret Mead said, is because a very few dedicated individuals decided to change elections in St. Louis. See that, understand that, get people to understand the difference it makes. Um, the stories that they hear have to be ones that are from, from sources they trust, right? I mean, to, to speak plainly, I can't go into North City and start telling these stories and try to get people involved. They're, gonna, they're not going to hear it from me. They, they have no reason to think that what I have to say is relevant to them. They need to hear it from people that have their experience, have their history, understand their problems, um, and they need to hear it uh, over and over again. So much good information we're covering here, Wally. I know that for some of us, we started at about five minutes after the hour, so I know we're creeping up on about an hour of conversation with Wally, and I want to be respectful of Wally's time, but also of everyone else's time. I know many of you are joining us on your lunch break or listening while you're trying to keep working. Um, so I want to remind you that you can put your questions in the chat or you can use the raise hand function, and we would be happy to take any of your questions. I know Colin has had a lot. And Colin, if we can get to yours, we definitely will, but I wanna make sure that um, some of the rest of you, especially those of you who have joined late, are able to ask your um, questions. Um, while we are waiting, I did want to just let everyone know that um, as we're talking about this initiative to bring fairer, more representative elections to St. Louis, um, while approval voting is a totally free switch, if uh, you know a city wanted to enact it today, Unfortunately, as we've been talking about during this hour with Wally, power structures don't necessarily lend themselves that way. This can be a little bit of a difficult sell, so we have to spend some money on it. Um, so the Center for Election Science, we're leading the charge on the educational campaign side and we'll be helping voters learn about better elections. So if you are interested in supporting that with a tax deductible gift, you can go to electionscience.org slash STL. Um, and if you are not interested in that tax deduction or it doesn't matter to you, um, then I would encourage you to go to stlapproves.org and make a donation there. Um, St. Louis Approves is working really, really hard to get the word out and tell people how important this initiative is. And um, they just can't do it without some money. None of us can. It's an unfortunate evil in this world. Um, I am not seeing any hands raised right now. So I'm going to go back to the chat and see if we have any questions that have popped up. I'm not seeing any from anyone other than Colin. So Colin is going kind of into a deeper dive. So I'm going to uh, see what Wally thinks here. So Wally, um, Colin is asking about proportional representation. So um, what about proportional representation in St. Louis? Do you think that's something that would be uh, another initiative that the city should look at? And what do you think the benefits might be? And, you know, just how, how about might just things there? So uh, proportional representation means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. 
Uh, right there's the fundamental there's the fundamental idea that if there are certain kind of natural interest groups in a community and they represent a certain percentage of the population, then a certain percentage of the uh, a similar uh, correlated percentage of the ruling structure of the governmental structure should kind of be reflective of that population. For some people, it's a much more uh, there are more. Uh, kind of formal systems that, that are about how elections, and especially in legislative bodies, how those legislative bodies are formed uh, for proportional representation. So I'm not sure um, uh, for exactly what the question is about or what's being proposed. Um, we do, you know, I, yeah. And so let me ask, let me ask that back. Like what proportional representation in what sense, Colin, if you want to, if you want to give us a, give us an idea. And it looks like Kirsten, you're saying you're doing a deep dive on it next week. Right, is there a specific uh, thing that you're talking about? So we will have Fair Vote Canada on next week talking about their fight for proportional representation with multi-winner elections. And I think um, okay. Colin's point here is just that there are some elections in, in St. Louis, um, like say for multi-winner races, where we could be looking at that kind of reform. Um, so just, you know, do we, is that, um, you know, like, are we seeing the same magnitude of issues there? Um, that we're seeing in these single winner races, like for mayor, for example. Yeah. Well, St. Louis has its history of problems with multi winner races as well. Um, I forget which school district up in North, I think it was actually North County, uh, that actually had a federal lawsuit uh, about how they were doing their at large elect elections or. Um, uh, or electing uh, by districts, and they mandated an entirely new system. Um, I, I don't want to speak from an uninformed viewpoint on some of this stuff. So I'm not an expert on some of those, especially those, those uh, you know, school board races where you tend to have multi multiple winners um, those kind of lower, uh, lower level local elections um, in those kind of really hyper local elections, systemic effects are often swamped by small level local circumstances. Uh, somebody who get who's known really well in the region, somebody who everybody you know in the community knows did X, Y, and Z or has X, Y, and Z. So the smaller, the smaller the electoral body gets, the more that like systemic kind of statistically predictable issues start to get swamped by just local circumstances. Um, so numbers wise, for the trends to be, to be predictable in any sense. Um, so I don't know at all if that helps or answered the question. <laughs> well, if it doesn't, Colin um, has been on many, many of our calls and Colin, feel free to uh, email us and we can keep the conversation going um, because it's always a, a good time digging in here. Does anyone else have any other questions for Wally? Um, Oh, I have a question I, I ask in the chat. But, um, I was wondering, I think Ben had mentioned that the primary is only about a month before the general election. And that's kind of not typical. Usually you have about five or six months between the primary and the general election. And I don't know much about how elections are run in St. Louis. Is that typical of all the primary general elections that you have there? How does the, the new system you're implementing differ from the old one? I do not think in Benj, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I do not think that anything in this uh, bill changes the calendar of elections. Um, what it does do is change the nature of elections. So fundamentally, 
Um, there are no more party primaries. There is only one general prime, one general primary with all the candidates in it, and then um, the uh, general, excuse, election is a runoff between the top two vote getters in that general primary. Um, I don't think this changes the uh, calendar at all. And you're right that some of those calendars here in St. Louis are pretty fast. I do not know whether that's typical of other cities or not. In fact, folks at CES might know a little bit more about that than I do. So I'm seeing in the chat, Ben just saying that one or two months is actually pretty common in many runoffs for local and state elections across the country. So it seems like uh, this is mirroring that. Um, and Ben just, just reminding what, what Wally said that, you know, we're not changing the election dates or anything like that. So hopefully that got at that question, Brian. If not, feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, Velma asks, are there any provisions to have poll watchers in polls that are nonpartisan? Um, this initiative doesn't have any language to that effect. Um, and I don't know, Wally, if you have anything to, to add there on, on this process. Did we lose Wally? Sorry about that, I'm back. That's okay. Um, so, did you hear my question? I'm having a little bit of internet connectivity issues, uh, but I think we're I think we're good at the moment. Sorry about that. That is that is a okay. So, um, I did poll not. watchers. So, the question was about poll watchers, and um, you know, if the initiative, if there were any provisions to have poll watchers in the polls that are nonpartisan. Um, I don't think there's anything in this initiative that's talking about that, but uh, Velma is saying that one of their concerns is that the election, you know, just about monitoring the, the process. So any thoughts on that, Wally? Yeah. Um, so, so I think that's right. Uh, and Benj, you can confirm this. There isn't anything about poll watchers in this bill. Um, however, that's a system uh, that's already in place. There are poll watchers. You can uh, register to be a poll watcher. You can sign up to be a poll watcher. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious, uh, 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 how are you doing, Velma? It's good, good to see you. Um, I'm curious what the concern is uh, about that poll watching uh, having more monitoring of voting at the polling place would solve. Um, the biggest issues at the polling place are usually this, uh, right? Uh, that, the poll, that the poll workers are doing the right things in terms of making sure that there is as much access as possible for the folks that are voting. Um, and you're all frozen. I'm assuming you can still hear me. Um, but yes, we can uh, still hear you. And the other thing is, oh, okay, good. The other thing is electioneering outside of the polling place, uh, making sure people aren't, uh, you know, getting too getting too close in. Um, I th the the kind of keeping people away from the polls and the kind of voter intimidation, the misinformation that's out there about elections. Um, especially, I mean, we've seen these things in Velma. I know you've seen these things in the past here in St. Louis, um, that, you know, sending out information with the wrong election date, sending out information with the wrong polling place, uh, those kinds of really nasty tricks, I think for me would be a bigger concern, uh, than what happens precisely at the polling place. And none of that is stuff that this particular initiative can touch, right? And I think it's smart, right? This initiative does one simple thing, uh, but Velma, you're absolutely right that we need to be looking at all aspects of the voting process, where people get their information, who's sending out that information, uh, where those polling places are, how, how much access they have to get their IDs. In St. Louis City, we just shut down one of the DMV offices where a lot of North City folks used to go to get their IDs. I don't know where they're doing that now, uh, right? So there's there's many, many parts of the process that need to be addressed and the system is definitely flawed and this is only one part of the fix. Yeah, 
Well, Wally, I think your, so your internet okay. is telling us <laughs> your, your internet is telling us that it's maybe time to uh, to for for one last question. So, um, right. And I want to thank you, and I want to thank everyone who came out today. And again, just a reminder: we will send this out as a recording, and we will share our uh, contact information if you'd like to ask us questions. And I'm sure others would like to do the same. So, Wally, in a, in a perfect world, we get this this reform, and um, we talked about it a little bit, but uh, I want to hear more about how you think in a perfect world we have this system, how it helps the lives of the average St. Louisan, how their lives may hopefully change. I think they feel a little closer to the voting process. I think they feel a little more direct effect from their votes in the voting outcomes. I think they see more candidates in general elections that are folks that are somebody that they actually want to vote for as opposed to kind of holding their nose and voting for them. Um, you know, so we have more than one Democrat in a general election. We have more than one viable candidate in a general election. I think that hopefully should be a big uh, change because if that general election feels like a rubber stamp party, why are, how are we motivating people to actually get engaged? Uh, so I think that's going to be a fascinating difference when that general election is the top two vote getters, the top two most viable candidates from that general primary. Uh, we're going to see a lot more activity around the general election. We're going to see a lot more electioneering around the general election. They might get those candidates contacting them more. They might get more information from the candidates. They might get more information from other parties about those candidates. Um, so I just hope that it just really rejuvenates the process a little bit and stops us from having a really exciting primary and a really boring and uh, kind of have to hold your nose and vote uh, general election. Wonderful. Well, uh, Wally, is there anything else final that you'd like to plug or, or tell anyone as you're, uh, as we wrap uh, up? I don't think so. We've covered a lot of ground. Um, I really, uh, the one thing that I, I would want to reiterate again is just, um, asking people to curb their cynicism about public officials and about voters. When you do this for a while, it's really easy to get dismissive. It's really easy to look for quick, easy answers. Um, stay engaged, stay optimistic. Um, we, you know, the, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Uh, we now, I think, have a debate about where that quote first came from. Uh, I think Martin Luther King Jr. pulled it from somewhere. But I think it's a long game. Every little step helps. And I think approval voting is a really powerful, positive step. I love that, Wally, um, and we certainly think so too. So again, just one more reminder, and I know we have several um, supporters on the call, Jan Koch, Rob Lanfier, to mention a, a couple, Brian Shank. Um, thank you to those of you who have made this possible so far. Um, you are part of American history, as we like to talk about every time we're in St. Louis. This is a big deal. And uh, as Wally has pointed out, it may not fix all the problems in our society, but if it can even help make things a little bit more fair, um, I think that's a, a fight worth fighting. So thank you, for thank you, Wally, for joining us and sharing all of your insights on the history of, of St. Louis. And uh, if you want to help bring this to fruition, don't forget, you can donate at electionscience.org slash STL, or you can support the advocacy portion at stlapproves.org. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks to everybody. Bye. Thanks.